In this video, we're going to go over elastic collisions. Number one, by definition, kinetic energy is conserved. The amount of kinetic energy in our system before the collision will be equal to the amount after the collision. Next, the magnitude of the relative velocity is constant. It's just that the sign of the relative velocity flips. So we'll review what relative velocity was and how to easily calculate it and how to kind of see it, if you will, in the context of a problem. And then finally, more kind of physically, if you will, there's no permanent change in shape or structure. So you could put a, like if you had a little cart or something and it was an elastic collision, you can model that by putting maybe like a spring or something on the end of it. And then when the car goes and runs into something else, the spring would compress, but then the spring would expand back out and there would be no permanent change in shape or structure or maybe like a racquetball or a springy bouncy ball of some sort. If you could slow time down, you'd see the ball compress, but then it would spring back to its original shape and there'd be no permanent change, right? So that's uh, another meaning of what we say when we are talking about elastic collisions. So consider this example. We have a six kilogram car moving at four meters per second to the right and a two kilogram car only moving at one meter per second to the right. Clearly, car A is going to run into car B. Now take a second and think about what's the relative velocity between the two cars here in this situation, and then we'll write it down together. All right, so here's the idea of relative velocity. We have this object frame notation. So the first uh, subscript is the object that's moving in whose frame of reference. So VA sub B would say, what is the motion of, or what is the velocity of A as measured by somebody in B's frame of reference? So if you put yourself in, in car B, you can claim you're at rest and everything else moves relative to you. B is moving at constant velocity, so it just says it's at rest and everything else seems to be moving relative to me, okay? And then you look behind you if you're in B and you see car A coming towards you, but they're not coming towards you at four meters per second. This four meters per second, that's how fast A is going as seen by somebody in the Earth's frame of reference, as seen by somebody who's just sitting on the surface of the Earth watching these two cars travel to the right. Um, so what you then have to do to find out the speed or the velocity, I should say, of A as measured by someone in B's frames, you have to subtract off uh, the motion of object B or the velocity of B in the Earth's frame of reference. All right, so what this is now saying is take the velocity of A in the Earth frame and subtract off of that the velocity of B in the Earth frame, and that'll tell you how fast A seems to be moving as measured by somebody in B's frame of reference. Okay, so maybe <laughs> pause the video there, go back and kind of re-think uh, through that and there's a lot of subscripting and talking about A and B and whatever that you need to kind of think through. But at the end of the day, uh, the main pattern is pretty easy where, um, you know, you've got the Earth's frame of reference on both terms that are on the right, and then there's a subtraction sign. And you just kind of have to remember that um, you're subtracting off the frame of reference that you're in, essentially, over there on the right. So if we were to then write this out, it would be three meters per second. So we'll just kind of do that quickly. Uh, the velocity of A is seen by somebody in B's frame of reference or by somebody in car B would be three, positive three meters per second. So if we had a coordinate axis like this, um, here's zero, plus and minus, then you can clearly see that, you know, somebody in car B will claim that car A is moving to the right in their frame of reference coming towards them at three meters per second. All right. All right, now, Something really amazing about elastic collisions, and this happens only in elastic collisions, number one, and number two, it actually doesn't matter if the cars or objects have different masses, this will still work, which is very, very useful. You can see in this example, the car's masses are totally different. Car A is three times as massive as car B. But what happens in elastic collisions is this relative velocity stays the same, so the velocity of A is seen by somebody in car B. The magnitude of it stays the same. So it's still going to be three meters per second. It's just going to flip its sign. And so what that means now, if you look at our little coordinate system over here, right here, it means after the collision, we're going to see the cars separate and B is going to be traveling to the right 
faster than A is traveling uh, to the right. Um, we have to work out the math to know that A is going to be also traveling to the right, um, but we'll see that it is in this case. And so they're going to be separating now at a rate of 3 meters per second. Now let's take care of this minus sign and make sure we really understand the meaning of that. Think about it for a second. Um, as if you were in car B and you're now traveling faster than car A to the right, then you're going to see car A, from your perspective, move away from you. So car A, in your frame of reference, would look like it's moving this way. You're getting further and further away from it. So it's moving in the negative direction. Um, so pretty cool. Now let's take the next step and kind of turn this into the notation that we use in the context of collisions. Right now I'm using the notation of relative velocity by talking about the Earth's frame of reference. But when we do this calculation in the context of collisions, we don't need to reference that, you know, this is in the Earth's frame. We know that. I'll show you what we could do just to be really, really formal about it. Um, but then I'm not going to uh, do that because it, it's kind of annoying with the subscripting. So let's take a look at that next. All right. So next what we can do is we can write out the primary mathematical condition for elastic collisions. That's a sentence, right? Um, I guess in simpler speak, it's just showing that kinetic energy before and after is the same. So A initial plus kinetic energy of B initial, that better be equal to the kinetic energy of A final plus the kinetic energy of B final, like that. And we could, if we wanted to, we could write out all of the terms, one half MA VA initial squared plus one half MB VB initial squared, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you get a pretty horrendous looking equation, okay? Um, but this is true. This is a true statement only for elastic collisions. And then the other true statement is that the momentum of A initial plus the momentum of B initial must be equal to the momentum a final plus momentum of B final. And that's going to be true no matter what type of collision that we have. Momentum is conserved. So what you can do is plug in for all the terms, masses and velocities, take care of all of your subscripts. And when you do a ton of math, you can actually prove what we're about to show right now. Okay, so I'll let you maybe think about that on your own time. Um, but what ends up happening are that these two things turn into this equation. And let's do, I'm going to do this, but I'm going to end up changing this. I'll do this really formally to start with. So this is where we're seeing the flipping of the sign of the relative velocity before and after the collision. So notice what I've done. I wanted to be formal and use the object frame notation. But whenever you're doing these collision problems, you're usually given information or you want the final information in the earth frame right here. So this is, you know, tends to be implied this little E right here. So we'll get rid of it. But to be technical, you know, so you know exactly what it is, there it is. And then we have our initial subscript. So we just find the relative velocity beforehand, initially in the collision, and that's going to equal minus the relative velocity after the collision. All right, so cleaning up the notation a little bit here, getting rid of that earth frame of reference subscripting, we can now just see subtract the two velocities before the collision, and that's going to equal uh, the subtraction of them afterwards with a little minus sign out in front here. So that will produce an equation, and then we can use momentum conservation to produce another equation, and we will then have two equations and two unknowns to be able to solve for the final velocities after the collision. Now, final note here before I ask you to pause the video and work this out numerically yourself just to make sure you can do all the algebra correctly and get to the right result, is to realize that this only works for an elastic collision. Okay? Anytime you're going to kind of memorize something in physics, you better with 100% certainty know that you can use it in a particular application or else you're going to just not know what you're doing. Okay, so if you commit to memory that this little trick works, 
then it, remember that it only works for elastic collisions. And you might be wondering, how do we know if the collision is elastic? Well, if you're just solving a problem uh, that you're kind of reading a, a problem in a book or maybe a test or you're just thinking about something, it's elastic if you can prove that kinetic energy hasn't changed before and after the system, uh, before, sorry, before and after the collision. Um, that's often too tedious to have to try to prove. So a lot of times a question might say, the collision is elastic by definition because I'm saying that is true. So you're good to go there. If neither of things are stated, then uh, you don't know uh, what type of collision it is and, and then you can't assume. You'd have to be given other information, work through the math, and then you'd be able to figure out at the end if it was or not. Um, so there you go. Pause the video now and work out the numbers and then we'll go over it together. All right, so here's the result. Over on the top right, I used our new learning today about the relative velocity, the sign flipping, and it produced an equation of VA final equals VB final minus three. And I've removed the units for clarity. We're in, we end up solving two equations and two unknowns here, and the units clutter things up a lot in these types of problems. So I'll put them in at the very end. Um, and then over here on the right, sorry, on the left, uh, we have momentum conservation. Now, I usually recommend you actually write out you know, MA, VA initial, plus whatever. Do it all in variables first, and then write out the numbers. Um, but I kind of just skipped a step so I can keep it all on this one slide. Uh, so you work that out, and you get 26 is equal to 6 VAF plus 2 VBF. Double check everything. Make sure you got your signs correct. It's easy to make a sign error sometimes uh, when you're doing this stuff. So... Double check everything, and then now we have a problem of two equations and two unknowns, and we'll just work out the algebra of that and see what happens. So give that a shot, um, and then we'll take a look. Okay, so let's take a look. Got my two equations, two unknowns. I'm going to plug in VB final minus 3 over here uh, for VA final. Do all the algebra without making any mistakes. Put the units back in. And I get uh, VB final is equal to 5.5 meters per second, and VA final is equal to 2.5 meters per second. Now, reflect on what we've done here. Look at these two numbers and see if you can make sense of them from that idea that the relative velocity magnitude remained the same, but the direction of the relative velocity flipped. Make sure these two results agree with that. So pause the video and think about it for a second, and then I'll conclude with a final remark. All right, so I've drawn the final picture over here on the right-hand side and done some calculations. Here are our answers. Um, two and a half meters per second for car A and then 5.5 meters per second for car B. Here's the relative velocity calculation. 2.5 minus 5.5 or minus 3. That checks out. Um, because it is the opposite of our original uh, relative velocity calculation, 4 minus 1, positive 3. So somebody in car B now would see car A go away from them at th uh, minus 3 meters per second, but car B itself, as seen by somebody in the Earth's frame of reference, watching both cars go by, would see car B now travel actually at 5.5 meters per second. Interesting. And then car A has slowed down up to 2.5 meters per second. Notice, and this is very important for you to realize because I see many students make a common mistake here. A lot of students will think that the velocities just swap. Not true. The, this car B doesn't go four and car A doesn't now go one. Uh, that only happens when the masses are identical. When the masses are different, then the numbers turn out to be whatever they are and you have to work it out. Uh, and here you can see that B is actually going faster than A ever went. Um, and A is, you know, slowed down dramatically uh, compared to what it was traveling before. Cool. Also notice that it's important to check that kinetic energy has been conserved. We haven't lost any energy. So I, you can uh, do those calculations on your own as well, just to uh, double check my numbers. But uh, this car A has 48 joules. A lot of energy is in car A in the system, almost all of it. Only one joule is here with car B. But then afterwards, look what happens. This is kind of like a dramatic change of affairs in terms of in terms of how the energy is distributed in the system. Now car A loses a ton of energy, but it gives all of the energy it lost to car B right there. And 
car B now has 30.25, car A is 18.75, and amazingly, when you do the math, it adds up to exactly 49 joules, which is how much we started with. There is no permanent change in shape or deformation, and the objects now are moving at different velocities, but the energy in the whole system has stayed the same, as has the amount of momentum in the system. So there it is. We've worked out kind of the full details of an elastic collision when all you know is information about the initial conditions. You know nothing about the final velocities, but you can work it out pretty easily. It takes a little time with all the math. Um, but with the relative velocity sign swap little trick there, uh, you can, you can kind of get to the answer pretty quickly. So um, hope you enjoyed that video and take care. We'll see you next time.